welcome to Remote Sales Live. I'm Jonathan Fisher. I'm host of the Evolve Sales Leader Podcast and Director of Market Research here at Overpass, and I'm super excited to have all of you with us today. Now, if you've been involved in business and sales for any length of time, then you already know that mindset is central to your success. Like most me members of our audience, you've likely heard lectures, read books on the topic, but have you mastered it? And even more importantly, what do you not know about mindset that could be limiting you? Well, today's guest, Dino Sutter, will be sharing some critical insights to help us with that. Dino is an experienced and highly regarded executive coach who's known for helping clear the noise, interfering with our potential, uncover, and effectively manage subconscious core triggers that otherwise control our behavior in unproductive ways and help clear the path toward becoming a more emotionally intelligent leader, operating in greater consistency with our core values so that we can get unstuck and realize more of our dreams. Dino, really excited to have you with us today. Thank you. I, I'm excited to be here. So Dino, I always like to hear a little bit more from you in terms of your background. How did you get into the kind of work that you're doing today? Yeah, I, th I feel like it's been a 30-year process. <laughs> uh, I was the kid in high school that wanted to figure out my brain. Couldn't I, I thought it was it had flaws and, and faults. And so my dad was an entrepreneur and used to have tapes with Zig Ziglar, Bob Proctor. Uh, later, we got Tony Robbins. You know, we've got all the books. So I, I started my process then because I was trying to solve a specific issue that I thought was wrong with my brain. Mm. Uh, and uh, so that's where it started. And it just continued, but I never thought of it as something that I would do in a uh, concentrated role in a capacity like this. And that was also one of my limiting beliefs. I didn't think that people would actually pay me to help them succeed. Hmm. Amazing. Yeah. And here you are. This is what you're known for. And uh, as right. I mentioned, very highly regarded. So um, I'm interested to hear more what you thought was a problem uh, in the way that your mind worked and how you've, you've clearly come to a different conclusion on that now. Yeah. So the I'll tell you what the original issue was. I grew up in conservative Texas. This was back in the late 80s, early 90s. And uh, I knew since I was four that I was gay, but it was not accepted. Right. It was the height of the AIDS epidemic. There was so much misinformation. So therefore, uh, uh, people had the mentality that if you were gay, you had AIDS and you were going to contaminate everyone. So obviously I didn't want that. I also had lots of friends and it, uh, if you were associated with that, you were a bit of a social pariah. Now I know that things have shifted and changed. We're in 2022, things are completely different, but you know, uh, 35, 40 years ago, it was, a, it was a scary time. So that's what I was trying to do. I was trying to figure out how do I fix this thing uh, that I can't get my, my arms around. And so I, I dove into a bunch of different practices and a bunch of different frameworks, uh, including religion. And, uh, you know, I, I remember when I was in high school, I, I used to pray every night uh, that God would solve this problem. And it only took like another 20 years and a lot of work uh, for God to do it. Uh, but what it was, the problem was never um, that I, my sexuality, it, it was always my self-worth. And so once I was able to start to understand what the root and the nature of uh, the problem was, it was that I felt like I was less than, that I wasn't worthy of the friends, I wasn't worthy of attention, I um, was a second-class citizen. And until I could diffuse that, then I couldn't really live out uh, my fullness and become who I was supposed to be and meant to be. And, um, and so that's kind of the background that led me into the space. It took me, took me everywhere. You know, I was a youth pastor for a number of years, did uh, incredible work there, built a, a group from 20 to 200 in a couple of years, started speaking on big stages. Uh, of course, that made the cage feel smaller and smaller because the more people knew me, the more one slip up. I'd, I'd built a life around a concept and an idea uh, that there was one thing that could basically take down the house of cards. And that was one thing I couldn't control. So it was one of those things where, uh, so I, I finally left that, went out to Los Angeles and, and got into the tech community and started doing my startups, uh, which I loved. And then shifting the mindset helped me become successful with that and then believe that I could actually do what I'm doing now. Okay, well, thanks for sharing that. So yeah. uh, the topic of the day today is kind of about hidden triggers. So yep. uh, things that are at work, 
um, at a subconscious level that are having many times under underappreciated effect on our actual performance every day. And uh, so I'd like, maybe start off, define for us what you mean when you use the word trigger. Yeah, so a uh, trigger is basically a negative emotional response to some external stimulus. You're driving down the road, somebody cuts you off. You yell at them, you honk your horn, uh, you shrink, whatever that response is, right? It's something that happened outside of you uh, that's uh, triggering a program within us. And the interesting thing about triggers is once you're triggered, you're no longer present. So somebody uses a word. Uh, I had a client who the word crazy literally would trigger him and he would get what I call emotionally hijacked for hours, spinning, hmm. creating narratives in his head about the other person, about himself, what it meant. And it could be as simple as somebody just saying, ah, oh, you're so crazy, which obviously the intent of that is not you are, uh, you know, crazy. Uh, but for him, it didn't matter. So, uh, and it doesn't have to be that extreme. It's the little things, right? We, we stub our toe walking through the living room and we think, uh, you know, we get angry and we get mad and we're like, oh my gosh, you know, the world is just against me. That's a trigger, right? Is the world against you because you weren't paying attention where you're walking? No. So these, they trigger these programs that say something about us. And so all the trigger trigger is, is there's an external stimulus that's uh, that you are now taking personal and, and making it mean something about you and having a negative emotional response, which leads to uh, negative emotional behavior. Hmm. Is it challenging as you're working with your clients, Dino, you know, to get folks to kind of own that? Like a trigger can feel like something that happens to you that you cannot control, I think, is that's yeah. a perception. Yeah, I think, you know, it's, it's super interesting because when people start working, they're like, yeah, this makes sense right? I, I, oh, I get it. I know what I'm supposed to do. Uh, but they don't pay attention. Right. So they, I had one client I was working with. So the first time I meet people, I um, help them understand my system, uh, which has a couple different components, the, the base level components to help them slow down time a bit and really understand what the trigger is. And one of my clients came back to me a week later and said, yeah, I, you know, I, I had one trigger. And I was like, wait, what? <laughs> Wait, in the last week, seven days, there's 24 hours. You, you have 24 hours in your day too, right? Uh, you're, you're in a relationship. Okay. And you've only been triggered one time in that last seven days? Yeah, no, you're not paying attention. So uh, I think it's also there's a temptation. I, I work with a lot of high achievers. There's a temptation like, I got this now. Now let's move forward. Mm -hmm. Let's go. Mm -hmm. Instead of allowing themselves the time to really uh, take in understand and spend time with themselves. And one of the things that I find with high achievers is we're also go, 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 that we don't ever slow down to take time with ourselves to really figure out why we do what we do, why we feel the way we feel. You know, um, Joe Dispenza says it great. The way you uh, think leads to the way you feel. The way you feel leads to the way you act. Uh, the way you act is your personality and your personality actually creates your personal reality. So if there's something wrong in your personal reality, then you need to change your personality. And that starts with the way you think. And it's, it's an interesting uh, way to, to, to connect the dots. And that applies, uh, what's interesting is it applies to every aspect of our life. We, we want to think work is separate, right? The way I handle life at home with maybe my spouse and my kids is completely different than the way I handle things at work. Well, unless you have two brains that are residing in your head, then that's not true. The same program that plagues you at work, the same program that makes you uh, feel less than, um, that you can't accomplish your sales initiatives or goals is the same one that makes you feel like you can't measure up uh, with your spouse or makes you feel that you're not going to uh, be a good parent. It's those same things. And we don't recognize or take the time to slow down and start to understand what they are. And therefore, we just think everybody thinks like this and everybody's going through the same thing. And it's not mm. true. Uh, yes, you're not alone. People do do that, uh, but you don't have to. It's not part of who you are. Uh, it's a decision you can make. Mm. It takes work. 
I love that. So I, I want to take a little pause and remind everyone in the audience, uh, we're going to be leaving a little time at the end for some Q&A. Uh, so send those up. Uh, we're going to gather some of those questions and get into those at the end. So Dino, I would love to, for you to, to, to begin to uncover, if you would, for us, what, you know, what, what is the process? How can one go through? And you know, keeping in mind, these are you know, professional people. They're working on the phone. A lot of these yep. folks are going to be by themselves for hours at a time. They're not in an office setting. These are remote workers we're talking to. Yep. Um, you know, what, what are maybe some of the common things they're bumping into and, and how would they begin to engage with the process to, uh, to, to, to discover what the triggers are and begin to deal with those? So have you ever felt like uh, something's a little hard? So then you get on this thing and mm. you start to distract yourself. Maybe it's Candy Crush. Maybe it's doing the New York Times crossword puzzle, whatever it is, we'll find a way. So whenever anything is hard, when there's a higher friction, outbound calls, hard, right? It doesn't matter if you're seeing them or not. You're gonna get hung up on a bunch. There's gonna be people who don't care. They're, it's hard. Uh, prospecting is hard. Uh, but sending out a bunch of emails and, and having to reply to a bunch of negative information coming back and making sure you're using the right word choices, that can be hard. Mm. So whenever things get hard, the brain looks for a easier path. And usually that comes in the form of distractions. So mm. pay it, we'll start with paying attention. Um, and one of the tools that I do uh, and is I help people create basically a trigger journal. So, but, but mm. let me do this. Let me back up just one second because I want to give you guys an overview of how the brain works. This will help you guys a bunch more. So the brain, think of the brain as a supercomputer. Super easy, right? Mm. It's got unlimited capacity to process any program and create any reality you want. Any reality, mm. unlimited capacity to process. I mean, it's amazing, but there's a catch. And the catch is it only runs the programs you feed it. Hmm. So it's kind of like having a Ferrari in the driveway. But if you only drive it up and down the street, are you really uh, using the Ferrari the way it was meant to be? Hmm. No. So with our supercomputer, we're only, uh, it's only processing the programs we feed it. And 90% of them are on the subconscious level. They're on autopilot. And they come from the past. And some of those programs are for you. And some of those programs are against you and you just don't know it. And I call those programs viruses. And the way you can discover viruses is by paying attention to your triggers. So, uh, and viruses come in two forms. One is malware, right? When I was five, somebody told me I had a big nose. So I thought I was ugly. Literally kept that until my thirties. People would say, oh, you're good looking. I wouldn't believe it. I would justify, uh, and I don't know about you guys, has anybody ever heard you're good looking and you fought it you said well except for my nose or oh, yeah well you just think that because yeah that's a virus so uh, that and that's malware right and it doesn't mean the person who put the malware in is negative or was trying to do it it was an offhanded comment but the way i internalized it and repeated it over and over and over it became this virus and the more you repeat any program the more it gets pushed into your subconscious which means you don't even know it's running. And so that's malware. The other one is outdated software. You're six or seven and your mom is flustered. She's got so many things on her mind. You're in the back seat, and you just keep blabbing on because you don't understand social constructs or maybe that something is happening to somebody else in the world. And your mom reaches her limit and yells, can you just shut up? Can you just stop speaking for one moment? And of course, as a child, that's terrifying and so you you zip your lip and but there's a tone to that voice and now every time that tone comes up with your mom you know to hmm. and that's great when you're young but what happens when you're 40 years old and you're running the boardroom and one of your uh one of your board members starts to speak in that tone and all of a sudden you shut down you get defensive you're angry uh you're stewing um you know you've now released cortisol fight flight or freeze uh, you're not sure exactly what you want to do, but by the way, you're just not present. Hmm. So, so that's what's happening on uh, in these programs on a subconscious level. And to give you an example of some of those programs at work, how about the fact that I'm speaking and I don't think of how the muscles in my mouth work in order for these sounds to come out? Seems simple, right? We just all think, oh, we can all speak. But when you were one or two, was it easy? No. It took a long time, it took a lot of repetition. It took a lot of formation, but the more you repeated the program, 
over and over and over, the more it got put into the subconscious. Same with walking, right? Unless you've had a major motorcycle wreck like me, there's never a time in your adult life when you think about, well, how am I walking? How many muscles play into it? Well, it's that same thing that's happening, uh, but the negative ones do the same thing. So the more we repeat the negative programs, the more they get put into the subconscious. And the whole idea is to bring the subconscious to the conscious with things we don't like about ourselves. Hmm. And we recognize those through triggers. And I always say triggers come in two form. I'm sorry, not in two forms. We've already talked about that. Uh, triggers are, um, are really great because they tell you two key pieces of information. Number one, they tell you uh, what you care about because you do not uh, get triggered by things you don't care about. We talked about this uh, before, but if you think you're a, an a-hole and, uh, and somebody comes up and says, you're such an a-hole, you'll be like, yeah, high five. That's how I make all my money. Sales from the a-hole perspective, it's great. It's not a big issue. But if somebody comes to you and says, uh, you're an a-hole and you think you're kind, compassionate, giving and loving, what happens? What did I do? What did I say? You call your, your, maybe your significant other or call your mom, mom, am I an a-hole? Somebody tell me I'm not an a-hole. And then you also may try to overcompensate with this person and go out of your way to be nice to the person who said something negative to you and or blow them up with every single person you know. That's when you're being triggered. So you only are triggered by what you care about. So pay attention because it'll tell you what you care about. And number two, it tells us the underlying program. What, what is the thing that's going on underneath? So, so the, the, uh, some of the tips that you can do, and this is what I give to my clients, one of the things you can do to bring the subconscious to the conscious, which is super important, is start by creating a trigger journal. Hmm. Now, I'm going to tell you how to do this in a really easy way. Uh, if you have pen and paper, please write this down. Uh, it's not super complicated. What a trigger, uh, how we define what a trigger is in the moment uh, is going to be different than what you think. What people want to do, let's say somebody cuts you off. Um, no, let's do a better one because a more, uh, a more typical one is a friend or a spouse or somebody does something. So let's say you're doing the dishes and your significant other comes and puts the dish right in the dishwater where you're cleaning the dishes in the middle of it, by the way, this is a true story, right? So what happens in that moment? For me, like, you know, my blood was starting to boil, like what? Because to me, it felt disrespectful. It's, it felt like I was the maid. It felt like, you know, I, uh, I don't matter. Uh, like I'm in, like all these things are happening in this moment and I'm feeling all these things. So that is the, the, the triggering moment. Now, what we want to do is we want to build the story around why it matters. Well, I've been with this person for, you know, however many years, and they've also done X, Y, and Z, and blah, blah, blah. blah. And we want to build this whole narrative of why we're justified with what's going on. But that's not what I want you to do. All I want you to do is just journal the time. Um, eight... 15 p.m. And, uh, and don't react in the moment. Just pay attention because, again, we're bringing it from subconscious uh, to the conscious, uh, from unaware to aware. You're just going to write down, uh, put the dish in the sink while I was doing dishes. That's it. Doesn't have to have a background. You can put their name, of course. It does not have to have a background. Doesn't have to be con connected to the fact that they uh, you know, walked out on the tab, you know, four years ago at this one moment, you know, and at the concert, they left us and only bought a soda for themselves. None of that stuff matters. Get really specific on what the specific thing is, because I need to tell you this, whatever they did that you're being triggered by, it's not about you. It's a hundred percent not about you. Unless they come up and they punch you in the face for something you said, it's not about you. And by the way, it's still not about you. Example, if you guys know Will Smith, well, I think we all saw what happened at the uh, Oscars. That was not about Chris Rock. That was about Will Smith. But Will Smith obviously was triggered, emotionally hijacked, and no longer present. 
And he went up and acted in a way that's not representative of who Will Smith wants to be. Does everybody agree that that was not his best version? Yeah, he agrees. His wife agrees. Chris Rock definitely agrees. So in that moment, was that about Chris Rock? No. No. So in the same way, when we get triggered, we want to make it about the other person. But 10 times out of 10, it's not about them. It doesn't even matter if they think we did something that caused this reaction. It's still not about us. And yet the trigger happens and we start to kick off a program from the past that tells us this is what this means. This means Chris Rock, you're a terrible comedian. This means Chris Rock, you're a bad person. This means Chris Rock, you don't know where the limit is uh, for jokes. This means Chris Rock, all these things can be going in Chris Rock's mind, right? This means you're less than, this means that somebody has power over you. It can mean all these things. Again, it's feeding back to these, these emotions that you might've had in high school or junior high or elementary school, but you don't know it in the moment. It's just, you're hijacked, you're hijacked. Happened to Will Smith. And then when he did that to Chris Rock, but that was not about Chris Rock. So we have to bring awareness. So first thing you do is just mark down the time and the trigger, real specific, and just start keeping a log of it. By doing that alone, you're going to start to bring awareness to every time you're having this negative emotional re response to something, whatever it is. Because by the way, Will Smith doing that on the Oscar stage, let's be honest, that's not the only place he's ever done that. I guarantee you he's done that on the basketball court. I guarantee you he's done that on set. I guarantee you he's probably done it at home over poker, right? It's just the first time everybody got to see it. So whether you're at work or you're at home, it's the same program that's being triggered. It's just coming up. But if you don't know it exists, if you're not paying attention to it, bringing awareness, then you can't do anything about it. Does that make sense? Makes a lot of sense. So, and I can also see the utility of, of jotting it down. You're kind of objectifying a little bit, which gives mm -hmm. you a little more, more control. You know, I think the, I think the whole thing about a trigger is it's uncontrolled responses. And yep. the moment I grab a pen and start writing, I'm exerting some control over that and, and giving myself a third person's view of what has happened and that which allows analysis. Yep. I, I think it's very powerful. So what's the next step? If I, so well, I, I'm journaling for a week. Uh, what do yeah. I do now? Well, so, so first of all, what you just said is so spot on. You've also interrupted, right? So one of the things is when we're getting triggered. Oh, I'm so uh, sorry. I didn't interrupt you. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not triggered. We're good. Okay. Uh, so um, yeah, when, when you're in the middle of a trigger, if you can interrupt it by paying attention and bringing awareness to it, it actually can mm. help stop the process of it. Mm. And what I always talk about is we want to move from uh, accusation to investigation. So, um, and, and there's an easy tool you can, to, can do with that. So what I mean by that is when something happens, let's say somebody cuts me off on the, on the highway, um, I'm going to get triggered. And when I get triggered, I'm accusing that person of something. So I'm accusing them of being selfish. I'm accusing them thinking they're more important than me. I'm accusing them of uh, thinking that their time is more valuable than my time. I'm like all these things I'm projecting on them. Mm -hmm. Is any of that true? Maybe, but maybe not. Yeah. Maybe it's a, a 70 year old woman or an 80 year old woman who, uh, you know, is uh, having heart palpitations, is trying to get to the hospital so mm -hmm. that they can get checked out. Um, maybe it's a father with a, a, a pregnant wife in the back. Maybe it's the person who hasn't had a job for six months mm. and that is providing for a family and doesn't have, you know, doesn't know how they're going to pay rent. And they're running a little bit late for an interview. And yes, yes, you shouldn't be late. And that's, you could have left earlier. Don't care. Mm -hmm. Doesn't matter. Uh, but in that situation, if we knew that this was their last chance at getting a job and providing for their family, are we as mad about them cutting us off? No, no of course not. Or if they've got a pregnant wife in the back who's try, you know, giving birth on the back seat right now? No, of course not. When um, sirens go by with a, you know, an ambulance, are we mad at the ambulance? No, of course not. But in that moment, it depends on what we're accusing them of, right? So we're accusing them of all these things. Does it make it true? No. It's the same with us, right? So what we're trying to do is we're trying to move from accusation into investigation. So even by writing it down, you're starting to bring awareness. And now um, there's a phrase you can use that helps interrupt the trigger. And the more you do it, the more it works. And it's, uh, it's, it's really powerful because 
the first few times that you say this phrase, you'll be like, ah, oh, that's not a big deal. But it, again, you know that old adage, 10,000 hours uh, to become an expert, but the reality is it's not really 10,000 hours. It's uh, a practice is 10,000 hours of perfect practice. Right. Right. Intentional. Otherwise, we'd all be Mario Andretti. I'm, I'm 47. Yeah. And I've been driving for 20, well, yeah, no, 30. I don't even want to think about it. 30 something years. Right. So um, I should be like Mario Andretti, if you guys don't know that reference, because you're too young. He was a, a famous uh, um, race car driver. We'd all be that, but we're not because it's because it's not concentrated and because it's not intentional so when i give you this phrase which is going to be very easy for you to remember you have to use it intentionally be intentional about it here it is that's interesting i know huge mind blown that's interesting but, yeah <laughs> right the the reason why you want to use that phrase is your brain is always listening and it's always looking from cues from you on what you want it to do. Hmm. So when it's being emotionally hijacked, your th um, the programming language of your brain are thoughts and words. Thoughts and words. So if you're allowing thoughts to go, oh my gosh, this means I'm going to lose my job, which means that I'm going to be out of, you know, um, my, my family's going to starve and, um, you know, and then my family is going to disown me and whatever, you know, we go through that, that craziness when one little thing happens and you, you just received an email saying, I, I don't know if we have the money this month to continue with the services. Mm -hmm. That means nothing about me. That's totally about them. But for me, you know, we're building this narrative. We're creating this whole chain. So we have to interrupt it. So when you start to feel yourself getting triggered and again, by being a bigger journal, you're going to start to become much more aware. So, and I tell my clients, if you don't have at least 10, and really it should be 10 by the end of the morning, you're not paying attention. Hmm. And the more you pay attention to your triggers, the more you'll actually get to, uh, you'll, you'll realize how often you are triggered. And again, I'm going to tell you, when you're triggered, it's an old program that says something about you. It's never about them. Because some of my clients don't want to say anything negative about their spouse. And I'm like, wait, hmm. when you're accusing them of it, it's not about them. I, in fact, I had one client. This is a great example. His five-year-old daughter threw down the brush, right? She was doing something. She was brushing her hair and she was throwing a fit or whatever. And she threw it down. And his immediate reaction was he slapped her hand, right? Hmm. And then he was like, oh, that's not my best version of me. And then he... No. Then, as a parent, you know, you're going to feel terrible about yourself. You're going to go through, what could I have done better? Oh my gosh, I'm going to scar my kid, all these things, right? <laughs> and so uh, it was such a great example because in that moment, what are you accusing your daughter of? And you want to say, but she did nothing wrong. She's perfect. She's wonderful. And it's like, no, 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 no. You didn't get triggered because she's perfect and did nothing wrong. You got triggered because this happened. And it triggered a program in you about yourself. So even in that moment, uh, you have to pay attention to what is the accusation going on so that when you realize you're starting to accuse, you can change it to investigation. And by telling your brain that's interesting, your brain has to shift. It does what you tell it to do. It has to shift from accusation to investigation. And the difference is uh, accusation is when the DA says, this guy's guilty, go prove it. And investigation is the detective who comes in and says, we don't know who did it. We have to get all the facts. Mm -hmm. Let's get all the facts so that we can put together and figure out who is the likely suspect. Right. And when you say that's interesting, we move from that accusation into the investigation. Mm -hmm. We move from it's got to be the husband to, um, wow, there's some really interesting things that don't align with the theory that people want to make. Mm -hmm. And that's us. Right. We want to make it that this person is actually very selfish and um, self-serving and doesn't care about anybody else. That's the accusation. But if we go into investigation by saying, mm, that's interesting, and we start to pay attention to clues, they're stressed out. They're taking care of uh, their ailing mother. They've also got three kids. One is special needs. All these things are coming at them at the same time, and they're barely above water. Do we think that they're being self-serving and they're selfish? No. So by just shifting from uh, accusation to investigation by saying, that's interesting, in the middle of your trigger, you can start to pay attention. Mm -hmm. 
So, it seems like you're opening the door to empathy with this as well, because we, you know, we, we, we tend to let ourselves off the hook pretty easily most of the time, unless we're in a down the dumps, then we're way too hard on ourselves. Right. We mm -hmm. tend to kind of veer between those extremes. Uh, and I, this is about maybe getting using, leveraging that objectivity in an investigative stance to yeah. actually see, okay, this is a human being made the same stuff I'm made of and there's other things going on here. And that kind of takes away this sort of, uh, feeling like there was any kind of like an injustice or there was like a mistreatment that happened and maybe see it a little bit more like, okay, it's just something happened and here's what's going on in their world. Is that, is that kind of on point? Yeah, hundred percent. I think anytime you can remove yourself. So you're basically removing yourself from the situation and becoming an objective third party when you become the investigator, right? It's not personal anymore. Uh, if you, uh, if somebody's murdered your dog, right. And you think you know who it is, <laughs> All the information in the world may not switch that you think it was your neighbor who yells at your dog every day because it poops on their lawn. You're like, no, I know yeah. they did it, right? That's yeah. accusation. Yeah. And we do that all the time. We get hijacked by it. But the reality might be that uh, another neighbor put out poison for the rats and your dog actually consumed it and they never meant to do it. But in your mind, it's their fault. So forever you have this terrible neighbor who's a dog killer. Mm -hmm. So we, we build these narratives based on information and our mind is always looking for connections. Yeah. And so we have to interrupt the connections because some of those connections, so I, I, I'll step you back and give you a, a little bit of uh, how the brain works. Every time you have a thought, uh, there's a neuron that's fired, right? Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's a neural synapse that's happening. Every time you tie a thought to an experience, you have a neural pathway. And if you have that neural pathway that's connected to several other experiences that are tied to it, you create a neural network. Hmm. The more you repeat it, the more it gets basically um, insulated, hmm. much like electricity. Uh, the speed at which electricity travels depends on the insulation around electricity. So the more insulated it gets, the more it's repeated. It's like putting another, they call it myelin. Uh, another layer of myelin uh, insulation around it so that it can travel faster and faster. And that's why uh, I, when we talk about triggers, it's a super highway. Mm. It's happening in a millisecond. We don't even realize it. Somebody, let, let's say you're talking to a client and they say something uh, and all of a sudden you feel like they're not going to buy. Mm. You just know they're just not going to buy. Did they say they're not going to buy? Is there, no, but you're, and you're going to rationalize that. I just know. I know how this works. I've been there. Like they always do this as soon as they say this word, but does that make it true? No, mm -hmm. but we're building this neural network where this equals this equals this. Right. And so then we're going to sabotage that sale. Right. Ourselves. Right. And so, um, so the reason why I'm explaining that is the more insulated it gets, the more it gets pushed again into the subconscious. Mm -hmm. So we don't even know we're doing it. And that's where we have to pull it out and bring awareness to it, which is why you do the trigger journal. And then the more you do the trigger journal and start to recognize it, when you start to recognize you're getting triggered, you're going to use the phrase, that's interesting to shift. So if you're on the phone call, if you know, you're know you doing an email exchange, I, I don't know what kind of sales people are doing, whether it's long tail or, 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 or quick. It I, can I be any, any or all of the above. Yeah. yeah. In, in our audience, it's at every level from yeah. quickly setting an appointment to engaging in a full cycle. So, yeah. Right. So there's, and then there's a bunch of different steps uh, mm -hmm. that, that might go into that. And depending on the price point, the speed of it, all those type things. So with that, um, there's all these opportunities along the way for us to get triggered. Hmm. To, for us to sabotage the opportunity for us to serve other people. Because if you're in sales and it's not to serve others, what are you doing? Right. We do it because we have a solution that somebody needs. Um, when I work with people, again, my, my price point is, is, um, is reasonable, I think. And the value that I give my clients has been phenomenal, but it's, it is a little less accessible to, to the majority, right? So when I'm talking to that, whether somebody has a hundred million dollars or has uh, you know, five hundred thousand dollars. It, you know, we think that there's no difference, uh, but the, the the programs that they're struggling with, the things that are going on in their mind, the narratives that they have, the programs that they're dealing with, are the same thing. The guy with a hundred million might have a thing where you always have to get a deal. There's always got to be a discount. If there's not a discount, I cannot buy. So you might think that they're trying to devalue your work. Mm -hmm or devalue your sale. 
So then the nature and the energy you're going to send to that person is going to be different because I don't ever discount. I don't, I don't believe in discounts. You either get my value or you don't get my value. And that's okay. Uh, and I've had people who push back and been like, well, you know, I mean, that's a lot of money. You should really. And I'm like, yeah, you know, I could, but I don't. And my clients come back to me because of uh, the breakthroughs and the experiences they have. And, you know, a number of times my clients tell me I don't charge enough for what I do. And those are the same clients that when we started thought I charged too much. So, yeah. so if you want <laughs> to get a discount, that's great. There's somebody out there who'll give you one. You just don't get to work with me, my system. Uh, and, and I'm okay with that because that's not about me. That's about them. The freedom in this also understanding that it's uh, that we have these programs is that everybody else does too. So the person on the other side of the phone, the person on the other side of the email, uh, the person sitting across from you from the dinner table, they've all got programs. They all come from the past. And a lot of them are on subconscious level. And, and a lot of them mean something about themselves that may or may not be true. And so when you can start to know somebody else get triggered, you can also say that's interesting. Because a lot of times when somebody else gets triggered, we get triggered. Mm. You know, the tension goes up, somebody, you know, mom starts to yell, uh, you know, all of a sudden you're getting triggered, what it means about you, yeah. when it really has to do with her having a bad day, or right. the boss, you know, gets a little excited, overly excited, or is a little harsh in their criticism. Yeah. And we were making it about us. That's not yeah. about us. I mean, we'll, we'll say, but our performance, but no, the way that they're responding is about them. The facts and the information, if I step back and, and go to investigation, I can, instead of taking the tone and the attitude, I can look at the facts and the information and go, you know, I could be doing better with this. And the, the, this is some valid points. Uh, and, or, you know what, this doesn't actually match up. I wonder if this is really about me or am I just the safest person for them to have this emotional vomit? Yeah. And yeah. many times it's just because you're a sa the safest person. And if you're yeah. underperforming, you don't have to feel like, it's the end of the world, like you're a terrible person, that you're never going to be good enough. All these things that the negative programs from the past are trying to tell you. Instead, you can interrupt and go, mm, that's interesting. Is it true? And I, uh, I, I tell a lot of stories. One of my, my clients was dealing with uh, this exact thing. And he said, you know, it's funny whenever somebody doesn't close uh, with me and he does exceptionally well, high ticket items, uh, seven, sometimes eight digits. Uh, that's his rule, right? It's obviously a little bit more long tail, but when somebody doesn't close, uh, it used to for him, it triggered him into this program that uh, I'm, I'm not good at this. <laughs> I don't know what I'm doing. People are figuring me out. And what's funny about that is he could have closed two deals the day before for five times the amount that this little deal was. But he allowed somebody else's program or somebody else's, you know, by the way, the company might just have been at a point where they weren't able to afford that price point. Right. It just is not everybody can do everything we want them to do. So, but he would make it into this narrative about himself and then he'd get down. And that's when he would ring me up and go, hey, <laughs> and he would use that's interesting. And if it wasn't powerful enough, then we would have to go through the anatomy of a trigger and the alchemy meditation, and all the other elements of what I do. Uh, that were super powerful for him. Um, mm. But but this happens. And, and the issue is, I always tell people, the reason why, first of all, people work with me, but also why this is so essential is you have the tools. I guarantee every single one of your salespeople have been given the, given the scripts, given the information, taught the, the things to do, the way to respond, the rebuttals, right? All of the uh, ways to answer the challenges. They, they have a messaging Bible. They have all of these tools at their disposal. Mm -hmm. And if they use them perfectly, the way they were designed, they would probably do exceptionally well. So the issue is never that we don't have enough information. And the issue is never that we don't have the, the tools to do the things that would make us successful. The issue is really why don't we do the things that will make us successful? Yeah, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And it sounds like it, it, using this framework to understand it, a lot of a lot of the uh, 
uh, scenarios where things don't go as desired in business as, as in, in life, it's almost like a chain reaction. It's almost triggers, triggering triggers. Yep. And it's a very unfruitful chain reaction. And we could say it, you know, the deal blows up. I mean, that's, that's that app terminology yep. um, where really, if we would just, we could interrupt that though. And we can, is what, is what I'm hearing from you is that we yep. can actually by, by getting that control, interrupting yep. that pattern and saying, that's interesting. We put ourselves in this investigative stance instead of saying that guy's a cheapskate, or yep. what's wrong with him or her, um, we start to look for clues. And immediately that changes the energy is one thing I'm seeing, Dino, as well. Like if I'm – like those are very negative things. So if, I'm, if I have this instant negative judgment about this folk, this guy that, where I thought the deal was going well, and now all of a sudden he's not buying, I'm all negative. Now I'm in, in an emotional state, in, which is in general more difficult to control. Yep. Uh, as soon as I'm in that affective, emotional realm – that's not a good place to be making some, you know, well thought out, solid, yep. logical communications that can lead in a good direction. So I like this, these yeah. tools you're talking about, and it can help me gain control. Um, what, what would you say in terms of like, like teams? Like, is there, is, is there almost, is there a team component to this? Because a lot of these deals that are larger size, longer tail, as you put it, um, it's not just one person working on this, right? You have maybe right. that additional SD, uh, original SDR, you have an account executive, maybe you have some sort of a team putting together proposals, folks up that are on the delivery side, you might have a team of half a dozen people involved, um, trying to close a deal with, with a team that might be in similar size on the other side of that table. Um, can you talk just a little bit about that? Like, what are the dynamics? I mean, that's a big topic. I realize probably no, another, I, another hour, I, but <laughs> I, I love it. I, I think you know, um, really, the thing I want you guys to understand today is that uh, everything you think and everything you say is not necessarily um, who you are. That there's these programs, and the reason for that, the reason why I harp on that so much, is then when you start to apply it to others. It really helps you become more objective about who they are mm. and what's going on. And teams, man, uh, when teams are running well, uh, it's so satisfying, right? It's like camaraderie and everybody's together. But when they're not going well, when somebody, it feels like somebody is dropping the ball and the communication isn't at the level where there's enough information, talk about triggers, uh, and to spend, yeah. depending on the size of the deal and what it means for your own personal pocketbook, because remember, whatever you earn, wherever that falls in there, uh, you and I, it's really fascinating uh, because I deal with high net worth individuals. And uh, I heard something from one of them that really helped me kind of understand a bigger thing. He said, Dino, I may be worth this on paper, but my liquidity is this. So when I talk about that, I have a 125,000 a month committed that has to come out, even though I may be worth this. And it seems that my liquidity is not that because of all these investments that can't be pulled out, can't be moved or aren't in a position to uh, be accessed. And so I have to figure out how to uh, address my liquidity, my needs for each and every month, just like anybody else who maybe has a, a mortgage payment and X, Y, and Z. Sure. It's, I go through the same stress. Mm -hmm. So money is one of the biggest triggers that we're going to deal with. And what we do and what we don't realize is that when we're working in a team, it's everybody's money as well. Yeah. Whether mm -hmm. you're getting a piece of the deal or not, keeping your job is money. So there's a lot of opportunities if somebody doesn't feel like they're pulling their weight or haven't done the things we need to easily get triggered. Mm -hmm. And what happens is they're messing with my money, which means I'm not going to be able to pay rent, which again starts this, you know, vi vicious trigger cycle where, you know, it's trigger that plays, then it goes and grabs its, you know, mates and triggers these other programs. And then they start to all, you know, yeah. It's uh, like pig pen. There's like this cloud of dust all around it and everything's getting swirled and I call it emotional hijacking. Hmm. So in teams, um, when you start to feel yourself get triggered by somebody else's performance or by the client's attention to what you're saying, that's the most important time to again interrupt with that's interesting. And when you go to that's interesting, I always recommend write down your questions hmm. for teams. What are the things that you feel like somebody maybe isn't doing or doing? And what are the things you need clarification on? Because what you can do is you can change up the conversation. Uh, because again, if you're coming from a place that they're not pulling their weight, 
the email you send off, the tone you send, the call you make, you're being triggered. And so then you're going to trigger them. Yeah. By the way, does anybody like to be confronted? No. Love does it. anybody like to feel less <laughs> than or like they're not pulling their weight? No. If the person's not pulling their weight, are they doing it intentionally? Probably not. Yeah. There's probably something going on there. Maybe they don't have the, the tools. Maybe you have a better big picture idea and they don't understand and they're getting caught in the minutia. Maybe they need your assistance and help. But if you trigger them, you're never going to find that out. Right. So you have to start to write down what it is that you want to know and then, and then continue to hone those list of questions by taking the emotion out of it. Because you said it earlier, and I'm going to repeat it, the way the mind works in a battle between emotion and logic, who wins every time? emotion. That's right. Yeah. Love that. Well, I mean, that's, that, there's a lot, a lot of, we'd like to continue the conversation on here, Dino. You've opened up the door, I think, for uh, all of our listeners. Uh, what I'd like to do at this point is maybe take a little bit of a pause. We're starting to get some questions coming in here and uh, keep them coming, send them in. We're going to get those dealt with here shortly. Uh, what maybe we could kind of do is um, at least give folks, uh, what would be a great entree into your world, Dino? If they want to take today's conversation and learn a little bit more, what are some of the best ways they could do that before we continue the conversation here? Okay, so uh, are you asking for my stuff or are you asking about yeah. just in general books and things to pay attention to? Yeah, what, what, so resources you would recommend for folks that uh, yep. want to take today's uh, insights and run with them. Yeah, so uh, I, I would say, first of all, if you follow me, I, I write and talk about this all the time. So I'm on LinkedIn. Hmm. Uh, I've got 20 something thousand uh, people that are tuning in. Uh, and you can just find me at Dino Sutter. I'm the only one. I'm really easy to find. Same with Instagram, uh, Dino Sutter, pretty much everything Twitter, Dino Sutter, although I'm not as active on Twitter as I could be. Uh, so that's an easy way. And I'm usually posting once to, um, uh, once to twice a week. Sometimes you get five days and I'm always challenging and also offering up these tips and tricks. So that's, okay. that's one way you could do it. Um, I've got a, a website that's been in development for a year. So yes, uh, and it's funny because I used to get triggered by the idea of dealing with it, mm -hmm. uh, but but I'm not at all because all my clients have come to me through referral. And so, uh, which is a great thing. It's, I, I don't even ask people, who do you know? Uh, people just reach out and they go, hey, I know X, I heard you're doing this, could we meet? Sure, let's jump on a Zoom, let's do a discovery call. However, I did just um, launch a website about something else I'm doing called Rising Tides Club. Mm. And so on that, you can see a couple of videos of what I talk about, what we're going to do, but also some of that. In the future, this has been encouraged by everyone, um, I am going to be launching some challenges as well as some uh, courses that are going to be very accessible and easy that will kind of walk you through. Uh, one of the things that um, I do is I have a system uh, and it, it's uh, the accelerated mindset system. It's basically, we're going to try to accelerate uh, the change and transformation in your mindset so that you can achieve anything you want. And in that, I have a thing called the anatomy of a trigger where you remember how I talked about triggers. It's like a super highway. It's a millisecond, one entrance, one exit. We, we pull upon Viktor Frankl. If you don't mm. know who Viktor Frankl yeah, is, he wrote a book for meeting. Best yeah. titles of the 20th century, top like top 10 in my book. Yeah, phenomenal. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's a little gut-wrenching. Uh, so mm -hmm. if you pick it up, I think you should. The first half of the book is all about his experience in the Holocaust. And the second is what he learned and uh, and how he applies it in psychology. And he created a thing called Logos um, uh, Therapy, which is basically meaning therapy. Yeah. Um, but one of the things he says is there's a space between stimulus and response. And in that space is freedom. It's the freedom of choice. Hmm. That's what we do in the anatomy of a trigger. We pull it apart and we analyze it. So we're stretching it out. So we understand the underlying components of how do we get from having a good time, having a drink, somebody saying something and us throwing the glass across the bar, you know, hmm. like, how do we do that? Or how do we have a great day? A couple big wins, one email comes in and we're spiraling for the rest of the day on our phone doing candy crush. Right. Yeah. How yeah. do we interrupt that? So it pulls it apart so that instead of having a millisecond on that super highway, you'll have a second or two. And when you're on a super highway going 200 miles an hour, a second or two gives you lots of options. Mm 
Yeah, for sure. There's lots of other exits and you get to choose it. And then incorporate with that will also be what I call my alchemy meditation, which here's the thing. If you don't meditate, I would recommend everybody get into a meditation practice of some sort. I'm not the guy who can just clear my head and get rid of it all. So I need to do a visualization meditation. And the one that we have called alchemy, what it does is it takes this information, the anatomy of a trigger, and you go back and you experience it again in meditation. And the great thing about the brain, the brain doesn't know the difference between reality and not reality. I'll give you an example. You're in the movie theater. The guy jumps out with the ax on screen. What happens? You jump, right? Yeah, cortisol is released. You fight, flight, or freeze. Your heart starts to beat. You can feel your hands are, you know, your palms are sweaty. In reality, are you in any danger? No. You've just paid 20 bucks to be in there with your popcorn and your soda to watch whatever it is. You're in no danger. You're in air conditioned leather recliners. And yet this is what's happening inside of us. Our brain doesn't know the difference. It's responding to the input we give it. When we're in a meditative state, it's like we're experiencing it in real time. Yeah, love that. So when you go back and you start to analyze this stuff while you're in there, that's where you can actually start to make changes. Mm -hmm. Because if I told you, hey, listen, we're going to do... Uh, I, I, you want to change behavior, right? Thought is not enough. Uh, if we could think our way out of it, listen, we'd all be super evolved. That does, it just doesn't work, right? right? Uh, you have to have thought connected to the body, which is mind with experience, to have a neural synapse connected to a pathway so that you can start to build a network. The interesting thing um, with meditation is you can actually, because uh, you can't ask your partner to put the dish in again. Hey, listen, I'm going to do dishes. Come put it in so I can experience that again. Or, hey, driver, can you cut me off again so I can feel what I was feeling so I can change the behavior? <laughs> Doesn't work, right? Hey, boss, you remember how you're an a-hole the other day and you said this? Can you say that again? See if I can respond differently in my, my side. Doesn't work. But in meditation, you can. You can actually go back. And we have this transformation element and component that when it, you, you do it, you come out on the other side, you go back and you experience it again, but it's a whole new experience mm -hmm. and it changes the neural synapse and the pathway in your brain and starts to create a new neural network. It's Good stuff. not immediate. So those things are coming. If that okay. Helps. Okay. <laughs> a lot of great tools, a lot of great uh, entry points there. So I love that. Yep. Well, I'm going to, I want to close this out with some Q and a, uh, we've got some good questions that have come in. I want to start with, with one of my own that probably won't take you very long to answer. I wouldn't guess, but I, there's an underlying assumption that I'm hearing that there, you know, you've already done all this is the phrase that's in my head. You, you've already done all you can. Right. So, I mean, if you haven't actually prepared, you don't know your scripts, you're not going to miraculously get great yep. results from any of this stuff. Right. This okay. assumes that there's been some good faith effort yep. on your part to take advantage of the resources that you do have. And there are some blockers in the way mm -hmm. this can solve that problem. Is that fair? First question yep. for me. 100%. Okay. The second thing is, too, there are not always only good faith players in teams. There are some bad apples out there. Yep. And I, but I think what I'm hearing from you is we let's stop assuming the worst of everybody around us all the time at this like semi-conscious level and, and being triggered by it. Let's let's assume some good faith. Take take a measured risk of assuming good faith, assuming that there's a better potential scenario here and move forward. And bad apples will reveal themselves, right? You'll be yep. all the better positioned as a team to deal with that as it comes up. And I've seen this personally you probably will have fewer bad apples, you know, when you, when you encourage good communication, encourage people to act in good faith, it, it, it seems to attract more good faith players. Well, and it's um, not only and, that, it's also that when they're a bad apple, there's a reason. Mm. They've got a program or a narrative that says, nobody else is going to fight for me. So I have to fight for myself. I have to take everything I can get. That's true. You may it's, not be able to solve that in a professional setting, you're not gonna but be you can have empathy it, for that at least, right? But if you can acknowledge that, yeah. And start to understand it. You you stop having expectations for people to be like you. You yeah. understand that people are who they are and you take them at what they are. Mm. I, I did this um, in my family. We I have uh, two siblings. One's a dog and one's a cat. So uh, <laughs> yeah, the, the my, pets are siblings in our house too. I get that. Yeah, <laughs> well, so, but I mean like personality wise, right? So my, yeah. my mom is going through some health challenges. When you're going through health challenges, do you want a dog or a cat? You want a dog. The dog is going to come nuzzle up. The cat's going to sit over there and whenever they want attention, they're going to come over. And um, my, my other sibling was getting upset because the cat wasn't paying attention. Mm. And I had to explain, like, listen, don't expect to be a dog. Right. Recognize what people are and what they're capable of. And don't put the expectation because all you're going to do when you put that expectation is you're going to be disappointed. 
Hmm. And you're going to, and it's going to tap into your triggers and your programs, and it's going to make you feel less than. So in a team environment, if you understand that there's a bad apple uh, and they have a pattern of doing things that maybe aren't team player like, Mm -hmm. um, don't expect them not to be that. Yeah. Don't expect somebody to be something that they're not. I love that. A couple of questions I want to squeeze in here, but while we're inside the hour. So um, uh, Omar Mollis was kind enough to send this. How do we overcome procrastination and how do we fixate our minds on the job rather than other things? And he shares uh, his own example is, you know, he's learning about his own field. Like yeah. he's into cybersecurity and he knows he wants to delve deeper on that, but there's, a, you know, the learning is more attractive than the doing every day. And it, it can, it can really be a, a hindrance. What can you give just some broad brush help here to Omar? Yeah. So I, I love time blocking anyways. I, I don't know how it works within that specific vertical. I love time blocking. And if you give yourself a lot of time uh, to do certain things. So if you have to do prospecting or you have to do the sales put a time block and all you're going to do is during that time. And the temptation again is going to be to go and do, Oh, but I need to do more research so that I can do this thing. What you have to do is say, Oh, that's a trigger. It's hard. This is hard. Therefore the friction point is high. So I'm going to, I'm, I've time blocked. All I am going to allow myself to do is this one thing. And we all want to be multitaskers, by the way, I, I get it. But multitasking until you're at a high leadership level, you don't really need to be one, you need to be a time blocker. So block off the time, be really specific with what you're doing, understand it, and then know that you have an opportunity because you built a time block to go do research later, mm. more investigation later. If you have a time and place for everything, it doesn't become immediate. If yeah. you don't have the time blocked off, then it feels like it's really relevant right now. And it can take you through that um, rabbit hole. So yeah. that that's what I always advise. Block your time yeah. and be intentional about what you do with your time, but yeah. give blocks for every component uh, that you need for the job. And you'll, and, and kind of, since you know that there's a lot come to do something else that's important that can help you maybe push that to the side. I've yes. heard, and I've seen a lot of research that, you know, super high performers do not work by task, li task lists actually at all, most of them, most of the highest performing people, literally at all. Everything is according to a time schedule. This is when I'm going to yep. do this. This is when I'm going to do that and so forth. And that's how they, they remain effective. Um, I love that. Another question from Miranda. She's asking, how long does this process take once you start to identify your triggers um, and that whole, you know, journaling it, saying that's interesting. Yep. Is there a typical time frame to where you're, I mean, that's a really open question, but like, I think question. what we're trying to say is, is there a way to, you know, pro pro project forward? What would it be for me to, I feel blocked, you know, how can I solve, say, a, a specific set of issues? Typically? Yeah, so I, first of all, I, I think what we do is we focus on the specific set of issues mm -hmm. and not that there's a program underlying it that's causing the issues. It's mm -hmm. kind of like putting a Band-Aid. When's my wound going to heal? Well, have you cleaned it? Mm. If you haven't cleaned it, it's going to keep, it's going to keep pussing. It's going to keep reacting. It's going to keep having issues. You can put as many Band-Aids over as you want. It's not solving the issue. So what we need to do is not pay attention to the issues. We need to pay attention to the programs. And the way to get to the programs is by doing the trigger journal and paying attention. What's going on there? Where is this coming from? So once you start getting a, a, um, the trigger journal done, and I actually wrote an article about this on LinkedIn. So if you go to mine and you look for uh, an article, I wrote about this. What you can do is you can start to identify where it's coming from. Is it coming uh, from personal, professional, uh, or money? basically are the three biggest key components, right? Um, and, and then you can start to see there's some program that's tied to either personal, like my self-worth, the way I look, whatever, professional, my job performance, my ability to do X, Y, and Z, or money. Um, and by the way, a lot of our issues uh, in professional will also have to do with our money. And our money will come from when we were young and the programs we learned from our parents about what money means how it's utilized, what it means about us and all this other stuff. So we can start to pay attention. Your question was how long? If you did seven days this week, if you started doing it every single day and marking down at least a minimum of 10 triggers, what you'll notice in a week is that uh, you're aware mm -hmm. that you're getting triggered, which by the way, before you weren't being aware, right? You're bringing awareness. Right. And the more you do it, the more you might start to pick up on the nuanced triggers. Because there's big triggers and there's small triggers, right? There's, uh, I'm uh, sending out an email and I can't figure out this one thing. And oh, I'm now I'm on YouTube and I'm down the rabbit hole. Mm. Whatever it is, that's a trigger. You, you got to a place where something was hard. You couldn't figure it out. And 
you got a ding from a Slack. So you got on a Slack channel with people and started answering everybody's questions that didn't matter if you answered it, whatever that is, you'll start to become aware. The more awareness you bring, the more you have an opportunity to do something about it. And again, once I uh, finish doing the digital courses on the tools, you'll be able to actually take all those triggers and you start to process it through the system. Hmm. And then literally within 30 days, my clients, uh, remember they're CEOs, right? They're running large corporations. They're, they're the heads of stuff. Hmm. Will say to me, Dino, this is the first time in my life I've ever felt in control or Dino, uh, I'm starting to feel in control. And what they're basically saying is they're getting in control of their emotions because nobody thinks they're out of control. Hmm. But if somebody else has power over you to get you triggered, to make you upset, to make you feel small, to make you feel anything that's negative, then you're not in control. Yeah. And the whole idea is to give us back control so that when we are, when something is presented to us that we like or don't like, we are in clear mind with full clarity to decide from the best version of us how we want to respond. Hmm. That's where the power comes. We get to choose who we are in that moment. And at the end of the day, I always tell my clients, the way you know that it's working is at the end of the day, you lay your head on the pillow and uh, you look back at all the decisions and you're proud of them. Love that. Well, Dina, you've left us with a lot of great content today, and uh, what a joy it's been. The hour has absolutely blown by, and uh, if, if, if we can, I think we're going to keep our eyes out for your, your upcoming offerings. Maybe we can even have you come back, uh, but I want to thank you on behalf of the whole Overpass team for being with us today. You bet. You bet. Thank you for having me, guys. Appreciate it, and if anybody has any questions, uh, feel free to reach out on any of my media. All right. And thanks also to our fantastic audience. Uh, again, on behalf of the whole team here at Overpass and for Dino, I'm Jonathan Fisher signing off. Thanks so much for being here for Remote Sales Live.